All right. In this last section, we're going to talk about um, changing inflation and unemployment and how it relates to business fluctuations or, or business cycles. Um, so business fluctuations or business cycles are simply the ups and downs the economy experiences th uh, throughout its economic activity and, and usually in, in the short run or shorter periods of time. So our economy is going up and going down um, and it's fluctuating around a long term trend. And, and these are referred to as business fluctuations or, or sometimes called business cycles. OK, and there's different parts of the expansion. I'm sorry, there's different parts of the cycle. Um, there's expansion. So this is when the, um, the business fluctuation is uh, in an uptick. It's when economic activity is picking up or speeding up. So the economy is expanding. Um, the opposite that of that is uh, a contraction. And this is when uh, the pace of, of economic activity is slowing down. So that's, that's basically what we're experiencing right now with this, uh, this sort of uh, quarantine environment with with um, with the coronavirus, right? Um, economic activity is slowing down. Businesses have been sh forced to shut down if they are non-essential. Um, so bars and restaurants and things like that. Um, and so that that is resulting in a slowdown of economic activity. So right now we are we are currently in a contractionary period uh, in the business cycle. Uh, related to these concepts are recession and depression. So you've probably heard these before. Um, you guys were probably pretty young when we had our last recession back in 2008 and 2009. Um, but a recession is simply a period of time during which the rate of economic growth, uh, the rate of growth of business activity is consistently less than the long term average or trend. Or in other words, when business activity is the growth rate of business activity is negative. So um, so productivity, business activity is going down. Um, anytime we have a very severe recession, uh, we re refer to that as a depression. And there's really only ever been one in economic history of the United States. Um, although if, if things were to get really bad here with this coronavirus situation, we could feasibly go into a second depression. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully... Um, our government is taking the appropriate actions to prevent uh, a second depression, but it is possible that that's where we are headed. And if that's the case, uh, we're going to we're going to be in for some tough times. But hopefully our government is doing the right things to keep us uh, out of a depression. All right. So graphically, this is kind of what business fluctuations or business cycles look like. Uh, the red line is sort of the growth trend, the, the long run growth trend of an economy. Um, but in the short run, uh, we, we go up above it um, when we have expansions uh, and then we dip down below it when we have contractions. And so we're, we're sort of fluctuating up and down, um, up above and down below the long run trend. Um, and so there's two other parts of the business cycle that we haven't mentioned yet. Uh, there's the peak and the trough. So the peak is when we've are reached the end of an expansion and we, been, we begin to enter a contraction and head back down. And then the trough is the bottom of a contraction. Uh, and it's when, when we start to swing back up into an expansion. Okay. So there's four parts of a business cycle. Uh, we've got the peak, the peak leads into a contraction. The end of the contraction is called a trough, and that leads us into back into an expansionary period where we head back towards a peak. Okay. Uh, so here's a graph of, of uh, business activity since the 1880s. Um, so the purple parts of, are when we've had expansions. The red parts are when we've had contractions. Uh, so there's an illustration of the business cycle. Now you can see that it, it was wildly volatile uh, for a long period of time up until right around the 1990s when it's more stabilized and, and, and been uh, relatively flat, no extreme peaks and valleys, although we didn't have that, that pretty extreme trough there during the Great Recession. Um, but uh, fortunately, because of uh, the developments in, in economics as a science, we've been able to sort of smooth out those cycles and, and get us into a very stable uh, growth. Um, We'll see what happens as a result of, of this, this latest shock to the economy, but um, it, we're definitely going to have a contraction here. We've already entered it, no doubt. 
All right. So um, I mentioned this earlier. We talked about the PPI being a leading indicator. So let's make sure we understand what that means. Um, it's basically an event that is has found is found to occur before changes in business activity. So it, it sort of tells us where the economy is heading. Okay. So um, so economic downturns often follow reduction in the average work week. So when people work fewer hours on average, that typically is a leading indicator. It tells us that we're headed towards a contraction, um, a rise in unemployment insurance claims. So again, I think I mentioned this earlier, but we've had an historic spike in unemployment insurance claims, right? Typically it's in the um, hundreds of thousands. Last week it was th 3.5 million claims. Okay. Never, ever in the history of the United States, unemployment insurance has that, that sort of spike ever been seen. Um, so that's a leading economic indicator telling us that we are very likely headed into contraction. Uh, in fact, we are probably already in the middle of a contraction. Uh, another leading economic indicator is the prices of raw materials. So if we see a decrease in the price of raw materials, that generally is telling us that we're heading towards a contraction. Um, also a drop in the quantity of money, money circulating. Um, so these are all leading examples of leading economic indicators. Um, some other ones include um, the yield curve, which uh, I'll probably show you at some point, as well as uh, something called a, a leading economic indicator index. So uh, something that uh, sort of takes all of these different leading economic indicators and combines them into one index um, that's also a leading economic indicator. So, um, so there you go. All right. Uh, so to wrap up this section, let's talk about a behavioral example. So animal spirits and business fluctuations can fear cause recession. So, uh, this guy, Maynard Keynes, John Maynard Keynes coined this term animal spirits. And it's, he's basically referring to how people in times of panic and fear can sort of revert to their animal instincts. So you've, if you've been to the grocery store and seen empty shelves, you, you've seen, you've bared witness to people's animal spirits, right? When people panic, they, they don't think as clearly and they act more like animals and less like humans. So uh, that's what we're talking about here. But um, it's basically people's innate feelings about future economic development. So some economists have found evidence that fear of a economic business downturn actually can increase the probability of that recession occurring. So um, self-fulfilling prophecies basically and uh, continued fear can actually increase the length of the of the downturn of the contraction so um, pretty interesting stuff um, we'll talk more about how later on in the term how this uh, how this can happen all right so this is going to wrap up uh, chapter seven um, hopefully uh, you are there uh, <laughs> Let's take a look and, and think about this a little bit more. Uh, is the level of prices rising in Russia? Uh, let's take a look at the Borscht Index. So Sergei Komorskov, I don't know how to say the last name. Is Sergei uh, tracked and published prices of key ingredients used in Borscht, which is a common type of Russian soup. Um, so this is, this is an example of a price index. Um, since 2015, the prices of key Borscht ingredients uh, have risen by 30%. So the borscht index has gone up by 30%. So the rising prices of borscht ingredients and other food items in Russia help explain Russia's annual inflation rate exceeding 10%. Uh, so this is just an example of, of an interesting price index, the borscht index. All right, um, some other issues and applications here. Interpreting employment data as the gig economy grows. So uh, we talked earlier about how this increase uh, in gig economy jobs has made it more difficult for the government to track uh, unemployment figures. Um, so the government relies to some degree on tax filings to track freelancers, which are those people who negotiate short term contracts uh, under which they provide labor in exchange for compensation. Um, now, the government relies on employer reports to track part-time on an, uh, sorry, part-time employment. Now, uh, the estimates of freelancers and part-time employment are undercounted as the gig economy expands. So this, this, uh, 
this is a problem for government agencies who try to track unemployment figures. So they're, they're trying to figure out ways to, to cope with, with these issues involving the gig, gig economy growing so quickly. Um, and here's a graph of the percentage of the U.S. Uh, employment that is part-time. So as we can see that uh, since um, the late 1960s, the percentage of people who are working part-time has steadily increased over time. We are now up around 20%. 20% uh, of those employed work part-time. And this could be multiple part-time jobs to sort of uh, try to get to um, full-time uh, full employment. All right, so that concludes uh, chapter seven. Let's just really quickly uh, summarize what we've what we've learned. So in section one, we talked about how the government calculates the unemployment rate. Um, it uh, it is a the fraction of the labor force that is unemployed. Okay, um, so real quick, just as a numerical example to to illustrate this, um, right? The unemployment rate U is the number of unemployed, which remember are people that want jobs, are looking for jobs, but don't have them. Uh, it's the number of unemployed divided by the number of people in the labor force, right? Right, those that are either employed or unemployed. And then to get it as a percentage, we multiply that ratio by 100. Okay, so that's how you calculate the unemployment rate. Okay, so if, for example, um, I don't know, let's just use our class as an example, right? So um, there's 20 people, let's say, in our class, and that constitutes the labor force. If three people in the class did not have a job, but they wanted a job, that would be the number of unemployed. And so to calculate the unemployment rate, we would simply take the number of unemployed, which is three, divided by the labor force, which is 20, and then multiply that by 100. So I'll let you calculate that on your own to get an unemployment rate, um, but that's how you would calculate it, right? Okay. Uh, in section two, we talked about the different types of unemployment, so frictional, structural, and cyclical. So make sure you understand what those different types are. Um, and then we also talked about full employment, which is this arbitrary level of unemployment that corresponds to normal friction in the labor market. And it also corresponds with the natural rate of unemployment, which is the uh, estimated long run level of unemployment in, uh, when the economy is in long run macroeconomic equilibrium. Okay. So this is going to be important when we, when we move on and, and build our first macroeconomic model, the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, which we will see soon. Uh, in section three, we talked about different price indexes and how to calculate a price index. Um, so make sure you go over that and understand that. But it's basically the ratio of the cost of a market basket in a current year relative, relative to a base year, right? Uh, and here are some examples of different key uh, price indexes that we discussed. Um, in section four, we talked about inflation and we... Um, uh, we, we evaluated who loses and who gains from, from unanticipated inflation. Uh, and we also distinguished between nominal and real interest rates. So um, uh, make sure you understand that. It's very important um, concepts here. Um, and recall that the real interest rate is the nominal interest rate minus the expected inflation rate. Um, and as we saw in that section, uh, people that lend money, creditors, will lose out as a result of unanticipated inflation. And that means that people that borrow money, uh, debtors, will gain as a result of unanticipated inflation. So people that lend money are hurt, and people that borrow money are, are benefited by unanticipated inflation. Now, what this means also is that uh, lenders, creditors, are benefited when there's unanticipated deflation, and borrowers are hurt when there's unanticipated deflation. So sort of the opposite when we have un unanticipated deflation. And in section five, we talked about business cycles, business fluctuations, and the different parts of, of the business cycle. 
All right, that concludes chapter seven. Um, I will see you soon in the next video lecture. Good luck.